and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name is Peter Bond, and with me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hello! Our producer, AJ Valeri. How are all of the bars, all of the levels? There's so many. All the bars, all the levels, they all look great. I got so many backups on backups. We are... We're so good. Backups on backups. And last and certainly not least, uh, the biggest thirst trap of the show, it's Josh Baker. I, I'm dry as a desert. Give me your... I, I don't know. What do you want me to say? <laughs> I don't know what a thirst <laughs> trap is. You see coming, baby, did you? <laughs> no, I don't know what that is, so... Um, well, let's talk about it later. Okay. So, uh, after our discussion of House of Chains, uh, Steve reached out to us and offered to put us in contact with uh, his friend Mark Paxton McRae, uh, who initially role-played the character of Carsa Orlong with Steve back in the day. So, we invited him on the show to talk all about his experience role-playing with Steve and what that's been like in the past and Carsa Orlong. So, uh, a big, very warm and hearty welcome to you, Mark Paxton McRae. Well, thank you very much. It's it's a pleasure to be here. I think I'm just going to kick it off. We didn't really talk about an order to interview, unless anyone has, uh, you know, Aj, any thoughts? No, I think go for it. I think uh, we had some right. lovely pre-conversation, but I think we just get right into it. Perfect. So uh, I think I'm going to ask the most, uh, to me, the question I think about most. Well, first <laughs> side note. You called him Steven earlier. Do you not call him Steve? I usually call him Steve. I call him Steven when I'm in a respectful mood. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I was just, uh, maybe we should start with just some basic information about when you role play with Steve, what that was like. I know Cam was involved role playing those games too, and just kind of maybe just some information about that. Well, I first met Steve uh, would have been 1987. Um, I was a student at the University of Manitoba, and I decided to take a field school in anthropology and archaeology. And Steve was one of the people who was uh, instructing that. He was one of the assistants uh, on the field dig, the field excavations that uh, I went to. And I had no interest in archaeology. I started because friends of mine said, hey, you love being outside in the summer. You can get credit for this course. So I thought, no, I'll give it a try. And Two days in, I was absolutely in love with it. And uh, I'd gamed a little bit with other people before, mostly Monty Hall dungeons, if you know that term. Yeah. Um, uh, a Monty Hall dungeon is, uh, you know, you kill an orc, you get 10,000 gold. It's uh, uh, They're kind of ridiculous. Uh, uh, they're, it's not great gaming. And then Steve and I started talking about the fact that uh, we both like gaming and he had some of his books with him. There was a very rainy weekend where we were both there. So we started uh, running a game that, campaign i don't think at that point was in the malazan world um to be honest that was a long time ago and my memories of that are kind of fuzzy i have a couple of memories of sitting in a leaking tent uh trying to move all of our papers out of the way of the, <laughs> the rain that was coming in and uh gaming with him then and i really like he shot he he taught me how to flint nap because he's a napper he makes stone tools flint napping or napping k-n-a-p-p-i-n-g is the term you use for making stone tools um huh. what? Uh, and uh yeah okay sorry continue he, he showed me the basics of that and then we uh we started gaming um gamed a few things and when we got back to Winnipeg, we, we both hit it off. Like, uh, I really liked Steve. He was a great guy to be with. I met his wife halfway through that dig. So we started doing just little bits of gaming. And uh, just to, to make it clear, um, he's ruined me for any other kind of gaming. It was the first time where we were gaming, uh, where I was gaming characters that actually had a chance to have depth. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, there, there was lots of times where I'd go home in a bit of a moral quandary. Yeah. But with with Carsa, I'm sure that Steve has told you about this. In fact, I think I heard or saw something about this that he said he didn't bother telling me that Carsa was a Toblokai. So I just mm -hmm. got told to roll up a sort of a barbarian character and, uh, you know, not, not to worry about the physical characteristics, just to leave everything else alone. And I just sort of developed the character. I called him Orlong. Uh, I'm going to jump around a bit. He could... He, decided to name him Carsa when he started writing the books and mm. uh, got oh. to the fact that he wanted my character Orlong to be in it. And he called me up one day and said, would it be okay if I wrote this character and I, I want to change his name? And I was like, well, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's your world. It's not my world. I played a, an individual in your world. Uh, so he called him Carsa Orlong. Uh, but Orlong mm. is the name that I uh, had written down. And 
you know, uh, we start off the uh, first bit of the campaign and I'm walking around talking to people in the village that I live in and they're all talking about how happy they are that I'm going to go kill children. You know, and in the back of my mind, <laughs> yeah, in the back of my mind as, as me, the modern person, I was like, what? Yeah. I don't know if I feel good about this, but we're both anthropologists and archaeologists. And you're the, the reason that I started really enjoying gaming with Steve and gaming overall is because you get a chance to actually step into somebody else's shoes. You can live a life you would never live. Or you can think through a life you would never live. Mm. You know, it's filtered through your cultural milieu and your attitudes. But, I, you know, when he said, so you're supposed to go down and kill all these children, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> here we go. This will be fun. <laughs> and it, mm. it, it, it wasn't until we got down to uh, Silver Lake, I think that's what it's called. Um, yeah. That, uh, you know, I charged towards this place and I'm like larger than the doors. And he laughed for about 20 minutes. You're a giant. And he just giggled. Oh, he thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that thus began Carsa Orlong. Uh, wow. For me, gaming with Steve has been uh, the, the best gaming I've ever done by miles, miles and miles and miles. I find it hard to game with other people. Mm. It's like a lot of people complain about reading fantasy novels after you've read uh, the Malaz and stuff for people who are fanatic about it or really like the uh, Malaz and stuff. It, nothing else really kind of gets up to that bar or very rarely is that bar hit and crossed. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. gaming with Steve has been fantastic. And we'd, we'd game for, like I'd go over there Saturday around noon and we'd game till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And Amazing. it'd just be him and I and his wife walking in and Claire <laughs> looking at us and going, oh, my God, you're still doing that and walking out. Uh, yeah, it was it was an absolute blast. Uh, gaming with Steve has uh, always been a joy. Uh, he moved away for a few years and, you know, I kind of tried to game with other people, but it, it's just not the same thing. So when he came back mm -hmm. and said that he wanted to do a campaign with a group of us, we were all really into the idea because I maybe extolled his virtues a little bit more than I needed to, but uh, he lived up to everything. I mean, <laughs> they were always fantastic games and they're always morally challenging. Like he doesn't let you off easy. You're not going to be able to just waltz through. Well, if you want to play a psycho, uh, you know, somebody who has <laughs> no, no, no understanding of compassion, right. then, uh, then you could do that. And occasionally we'd game with people who would be like, like that but they tended not to last too long mm. <laughs> yeah i think in some ways normal role playing can like encourage somewhat psychotic behaviors in players <laughs> so you mentioned steve came to you and asked uh you know about having i guess at that point or long in the story did that like surprise you was that did, were you aware that that was a thing that that he was drawing on like the games that you guys have played together um like for his his books no, I from the beginning, uh, when we first started gaming, when he told me about the fact that he and Cam had built this world and he started showing me maps, uh, the maps were enough, you know, as an archaeologist and a bit of a cartography geek, I was, you know, he makes really, really interesting maps. Uh, yeah. I thought, sure, if you want to turn any of this into writing, go right ahead. <laughs> you know, why not? Uh, you know, he and I talked about it a fair bit because at that point I was pretty interested in, in the idea of writing. And we talked about the fact that, you know, you, you can think through a character or what it's like to write another human being by playing, by gaming as a full person, not just as a cardboard cutout. Right? Mm. Because I think most people, when they first start gaming, and me too, I have really embarrassing memories of gaming with other people. You know, I'm going to have a god level sword, you know. Mm. No, you're not. Because mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantasy, right? right. Uh, like I first started playing D&D &D when it was still in magazines, when it was coming out of uh, Dragon, and I forget the name of the other magazine now uh <laughs> so when i was really young when i was like 13 or 14 right started doing that kind of gaming and i guess i steve and i hit each other at a, a really good point we were both really into good fantasy and that was hard to find uh we both liked the idea of playing rounded characters and and a rounded world and it doesn't take long when you wa start walking through the well the maps in the Malazan universe that you know this is full depth this this isn't just you know uh one culture with history that's a quarter of an inch thin this is well, archaeologically i worked with steve on one site and then the next summer i went to yugoslavia and in yugoslavia <laughs> you dig through four meters of stuff to get what you want and that four meters is all history like i was just telling a friend a couple of days ago that the first day in Yugoslavia, we were talking to the guy whose farm we were going to work on. Uh, and he was sitting, uh, smoking a cigarette and he leaned back and flicked his cigarette into this object. And I kind of leaned over to see what it was. And it was three quarters of a Roman pot. 
but that was just that was just garbage to him that was nothing right and that's kind of what history is like and that's the steve's a master in my mind at writing that depth of history you know uh i've never really read anybody else who includes history in that much convolution i don't how far back things can affect what happens now it's like looking at you know, the reason there are landslides in unexpected places is because six million years ago, a rock broke. Right. I did want to build on your point there. Obviously, uh, it seems like you guys, you and Steve have a similar background with it, but I've always appreciated the history and the the longevity of the world because I think it's clear that as a part of the work, it's uh, illustrating that, you know... The time we live in and the culture we live in, people act a certain way. Humans are a certain way. But, you know, this is an ancient thing. Time comes and goes and societies change all the time. And through examining the length of history and the fall and the rising of so many different things, you can see what the constants are, you know, not the variables of what is changing, but the constants and of and these things that fundamentally comprise the human condition in some way. I, I'd agree with you. It's one of the things that I find uh, very frustrating when I talk to people who are not archaeologists or don't think about history as being the continuity of human beings. We've been human for, you know, let's say 300,000 years, exactly like you and me, like, like all of us. If we all got transpor- transported back 300,000 years ago, we'd be taller and have maybe better teeth and that would be probably the main difference they mm. they they cognitively and emotionally those people are exactly the same as us they the the the, the ways that we reflect humanity and what it is to be human uh you know you learn your morals from your mother you learn your morals from the people around you you learn the way that you reflect that his, that, that humanity uh, through the people immediately around you and that's piled on the people that came just slightly before them and just slightly before them. Like when you look at stone tools, when you look at arrowheads, the base part that gets tied onto the shaft, that's for an archaeologist, that's really important because your granddad maybe taught you how to do that and his granddad taught him how to do that. And the guys that live 50 miles away uh, do it slightly differently. So you can trace the descent of history through the way those things change over time. The same thing with pottery, Mm -hmm. the same thing with the way people make stone tools and the same way politics and the same expressions of love, right? The the way people express poetry or express music. Uh, if you look at things that happened in even medieval times, uh, the method in, through which you have that emotional intercourse is very different, but the base expressions are all the same because it's the reflection of humanity. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Steve did the same thing. Sorry, I'm going to keep trying to bring it back to this. <laughs> we'll loop it back. Well, uh, yeah. I have a question then, um, somewhat related to this, although we got pretty heady so fast. When you uh, when you got to inhabit the character of Carso Orlong, was it, I mean, hmm, how do I put this? Did Steve, like, present him to you with, with these generations of ideologies and upbringing? Was, or was he sort of just kind of like a blank canvas that you sort of then painted on as he interacted with the the people around him in Steve's world? Well, Steve is nothing if not subtle. So when you start gaming with him, he'll drop hints and you'd better be pretty attentive. Uh, you know, I, I honestly can't remember absolutely crystal with crystal clarity all of the things that we talked about while we were gaming but you know i always remembered uh, i sort of girded my loins when it came time to start gaming with steve because you have to pay attention Mm. you know and he's got a masterful poker face when he's uh being a dm you have no idea what he's thinking or what's going to happen or what's going on so you know there's many times where i said okay i'll do such and such i'll do this action and just the look on his face and this deep twinkle in his eye that's like well you're screwed this will be fun <laughs> you know and and those kind of those kind of events uh had consequences like with lots of other games you know if your character says something stupid it can just get blown off but if you say mm-hmm. something stupid in front of let's say an amanda rake you're gonna have a bad time mm-hmm. You know, and that's uh, when we were gaming at the beginning of Carsa, uh, as I recall, we both sort of had an understanding of what uh, the culture would have been like. You know, uh, the suppositions that we both started with were pretty much the same. Okay, it's a barbarian culture. You're living uh, tribal life. Well, you know, 
I have at least a theoretical understanding of what that would have been like, what that might have been like or how I would reflect that. Uh, so we game that way. And, you know, Steve's playing all the other characters in the world and describing the world to you. So I'm trying to be my own individual or be the individual that I'm creating. Evolving is a better way to put it. Mm. Um, each game, you know, if you play a character that just rebuffs all actions or all responses to the world that you're in, you're a cardboard cutout or a psychopath. But if you're trying to play somebody who's an actual individual, you know, even really crazy characters uh, in Steve's world, of which there are more than a few, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they suffer the consequences of their acts, good and bad. And sometimes those consequences, you do what you think is a good act to save person A, and it turns out that the reason person A was being killed by person B is because person A, you know, ate somebody's child. <laughs> well, yeah. And there's consequences to that. And there were in, the, in those games. I, I don't know if that answered your question clearly, Joshua. No, I, I think I got a lot out of that. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think uh, something on my mind, I almost started the interview with it, but I thought it was too big a question. So, like, obviously, Karsa or Long, as a written character in the series, is a controversial one, right? And I wonder how you feel about a character you being played, and I, I would imagine it's realized differently in text than how you played it when you gamed it, right? But I wonder how you feel about him being a controversial character and him being a character a lot of fans love and a lot of people don't love. I have to admit I was a little surprised after the books came out and I started seeing reviews or seeing people's responses online about how controversial he was. Um, I guess partially because I was used to Carsa and I uh, Carsa, uh, and, and I sort of knew the reasoning behind a lot of what he did. I should add that uh, a lot of the stuff that Steve wrote is not things that we gamed. And a lot yeah, of the I things kind of that imagine we, that. Yeah, a lot of the things that we gamed uh, are things that did not happen in the books. Um, so I was a little surprised, uh, but a lot of, okay, please don't take this the wrong way, but a lot of what Carsa Arulong is in those books is me in a way. So when people were really angry of that Carsa, you know, uh, either was unbelievably egotistical or just absolutely self-assured, I'm not really like that, but, you know, I, I can recognize that reflection. The, the scenes where, uh, the, the rape scenes where early on, um, that's again a reflection of the culture that he sprung out of. Uh, that's, you know, I, I will tell you that I did not, we didn't game any of that. That was something that Steve, uh, wrote, but, uh, Steve likes complexity and so do I, uh, no character is flawless and no character, no human being doesn't have regrets. You know, I, I'm not going to make excuses. And I don't think that this is, this is not intended as an excuse, but Carsa as a young person who was stuck so deeply in his own head that he couldn't understand that his actions might crush somebody else. Uh, I can understand from a writer's perspective why you would do that because your character is going to suffer the repercussions of that. Like, you know, we all do. If you make a mistake early in your life uh, and you screw up something big, maybe 30 years later, maybe five years later, maybe the next day, you're going to feel the weight of that, right. you know, whether or not you want to. And I think that's one of the things I like about the way Steve took the character and just ran with him uh, and developed him into something that was I, I more than what we gamed, but not different from what we gamed. Mm. Um, you know, I, when we, we were playing GURPS, which is a system, it's all point-based. So I get given a certain amount of points and I can use those to create a character. And uh, Carsa was a very high beginning point character. Um, but we both kind of agreed that when you're gaming character in a world, you're generally going to play somebody who's going to be an influence in the world in some way or other. So you're probably going to be a slightly more uh, out of the ordinary or extraordinary person. So I kind of knew from the beginning that Carsa was, if you did scare quote this uh fated for greatness or fated for notoriety um mm. but you know i already kind of knew that there was something called anamanda rake and i knew that there was dragnapur um so you're a barbarian off in a corner in my mind i i never thought about being equal or even close to equal to any of those truly you know kaladin brood mm -hmm. uh anamanda rake any of the others you want to think of but at the same time you're playing a character that you know is as a player, you know, is um, extraordinary, many more points than uh, what a normal character would be. 
so I, you know, I, we kind of knew, uh, I kind of knew that Carson was going to be something. Um, you know, I've played a bunch of different characters in, that, that have uh, appeared in those novels. And most of them are, I think pretty much all of them are characters that are uh, influential in the world, in the universe, not just, you know, in their neighborhood, if you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, just a lot to chew on there. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, so you said that you played other characters as well. Can you tell us who they are? And also, it, um, like of all the characters you played, was Carsey your favorite? Um, Bottle was the other one that uh, we gamed through. Um, and that was with the group. Um, I also, I can't remember if it's in the books or not. And uh, I kind of sped read through a bunch of the books to get myself back in on this, but I, I concentrated <laughs> on Carsa's arc. Um, I played a vampire once in the Malazan world. And <laughs> but Peter's face, it doesn't appear. <laughs> that, that was a bad mistake. Oh, <laughs> that guy got the crap kicked out of him so many times. Yeah. Um, I ended up uh, asking uh, Baruch if he could make me not a vampire anymore because there was a vampire hunter in Darujistan that just continuously <laughs> every time I appeared I was like I'm really hungry oh I he had started off uh having just escaped the Segula Island oh um, that's because, I mean a whole stunt right there oh man that was <laughs> I, I we, we started with him leaving the island already injured because he'd made the mistake of going to you know the land of the Segula, which isn't a good idea. <laughs> They're not big on tourism. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that, that character just got the crap kicked out of him. And that was the last time I tried to flex in Steve's worlds because it's just <laughs> not going to end up well. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's so um, so maybe I should ask, how far have you guys read? We're up uh, to Midnight Tides now, so the fifth book. Oh, okay, okay. Um, We're like most of the way through it. Okay, I, I'll stop with anything to do with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll meet you, you'll meet the other character, Bottle, later in the series. Um, well, <laughs> uh, have you all met Corbel Brooch and Bocalane yet? We have. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, so were you involved with them? Did you do any of them? Please, please tell me. Well, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you that. It worked the other way around. Uh, Steve had been DMing for a long time, and I uh, maybe got a little big for my britches and said, oh, you know what, maybe I, oh, I'll run a game for you. And he said, sure. <laughs> so I built a, a – I had a city and a, you know, a little bit of area around it that I'd worked out a history for, and I thought, you know, I'll run you through this. This is kind of a good scenario. And he showed me these two characters, uh, one named Corval Brooch and one named Bocalane, and – that was uh, the last time that I seriously thought about being a DM because they just ran roughshod through everything. Yeah, oh, like he showed me. Oh, he showed me their spells, and I was like, okay, these are all minor spells. A little bit of demon raising, a little bit of this. You know, nothing. And he played <laughs> these terrifying, inimical creatures that could not be stopped. Everything I tried. Like one game, I had, I had. He, he destroyed everything that I thought that I had set up. So I spent like a full week and a half when I wasn't busy working, doing, you know, jobs and stuff, writing frantically, writing notes and had everything going and thought, oh, this is going to be great. I've really got something worked out. And Steve starts by saying, well, okay, so uh, Bocalane wants to raise a demon. And I go, okay, just a minor one, just one that I can keep. And I'm like, okay. And he gets this demon. And the first thing he says to it is, bring me the most frightened person in the city. Okay. Like, where, where do you go with that? <laughs> so I thought, okay, is it is it somebody who's being murdered? Is it somebody who's being part of the plot line? And I ended up coming with up with a, a person that uh, was not directly related to the to the thread that I had hoped to run. And Steve just like turned him into a slave because he's Bocalane and you know ran roughshod. Like the whole thing was just me trying as hard as I could to keep up with him because he's got an unbelievably good imagination. Mm -hmm. and a poker face wow. uh, so those two they still disturb me uh, yeah. they're 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 funny as hell and he's written them really well yeah. uh, they're great characters but mm -hmm. I'll never forget just how badly he destroyed <laughs> everything that I had going just oh. not even close mm -hmm. Peter and AJ and I have read the the first volume of the Cornwall Bridge and Bocalane books and I, I can imagine they are they are like the most to me they are the most interesting characters in the whole series so far really? Peter's very upset really? with me I, I love them everything about them I mean they're fun I just don't 
Yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far. It's, um, it's them and Tahol for me right now in my really? Mal- Malazan journey. Um, Tahol's great. Oh, yeah. Mark, does Steve do character voices? <laughs> Spill the tea. <laughs> oh, great. I've question. never thought about this. Uh, not at all. Oh, damn. Um, he, he will. Um, how should I put this? He's not an actor, but if he was being like Whiskey Jack, he was kind of a frightening person. Mm. Uh, th- th- there's something that happened in a game once that uh, never appeared in any of the books. It was a whole different storyline. But we were playing, this is a group of us, we were playing a bunch of uh, brothers who just got involved in something, found some armor and decided to wear armor and be cool and run around and do stuff because we were tired of living in the tiny village we were in. And we end up going through a gate, uh, like one of the the gates of the Warrens. And uh, we kind of went to the wrong place because we pissed somebody off who had really dark skin and uh, seemed to be pretty way more powerful than we were. We were like, you know, 16 year old punks in uh, fancy armor and Anamander Rake walks into the gate oh, no. and I'm like a level two mage. If you want to think of it that way, I've got mm-hmm. five spells and Anamander Rake starts walking towards us and I'm walking backwards down this path going, we're not your enemies. We don't want to fight. We just want to go home. We don't know what's happening. And he draws Dragnapur and the look on Steve's face, he became uh, just a terrifying figure. Mm-hmm. You know, I was already playing a character that was pretty scared. Uh, but the look on his face, <laughs> I knew I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm not just dead. I'm trapped in that thing for all time. Right. I need to come up with something fast. And the, the other rest of the group, you know, we <laughs> we played idiots most of the time. We just run into places and start hacking. Uh, <laughs> it, it usually ended oh, yeah. badly. Yeah. Um, but the rest of them right. were running. Yeah, the rest of them were running for the gate, and uh, in one of the few moments of uh, terror-inspired brilliance, uh, I took all of the points that I had, plus most of my personal points, which would have it damaged my body quite badly to do this, and I cast Create Ice over Dragnapur, over the sword, uh, mm. so it got heavy enough that it slowed him down for a few seconds, and we were able to escape. Oh my gosh. Uh, that's, that, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's a bit of an aside, but... Playing with Steve was always an exercise in, oh, my God, what did I just say? Yeah. Um, he, he'd talk like Krupp when he was playing Krupp. Uh, I, would that, pay, I would pay any amount of money to hear Steve <laughs> talk too. like Krupp. I got to hear the Steve Krupp voice, you know? Oh, yep. it's, 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 it's Steve's voice, but he takes the character on. And once he's got a role going, it's hard to stop. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, man. he and I... He and I co-played Scorch and Lef. Um, mm, I, I love don't... Scorch and Lef. They haven't read about them, but love those oh, characters. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that's oh, right. you're They're... good. I don't, you know, it's not a big spoiler, but I just love, you know, great characters. So you co-played them. Yeah, we co-played them. And I, uh, it, it ended up accidentally being a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern thing because neither of us could remember which character we were playing. Because <laughs> they were Beautiful. both equally stupid. But they got into yeah. hilarious, like we would lose our shit laughing at the things that like these two would get into such stupid predicaments (laughs) um you know carso wasn't really uh uh, hilarious right uh (laughs) occasionally funny but that was mostly in gaming stuff where you know something ridiculous would happen um but darujistan was a lot of fun to to game in uh that that's it's a marvelous city for gaming because it's endless possibilities right Uh, it it is the golden city right it's the magical city Mm mm-hmm We've we've been back uh, like reading since book one, but I am I am excited for potentially going back there. We were yeah, we really weren't there even in book three. I have no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I agree with Peter. And sorry, Peter, yell spoiler if I start getting too close to things. Cause... Oh, I will. No worries. I, I think it's all right. Yeah. So I mean, this was originally Carsa specific, but given all the characters you played, ha- did Steve ever? like call you up and be like, Hey, what would Carcer like do in this situation? Or did he just kind of roll with it and say, screw you, your, your opinion doesn't matter. Uh, generally screw you. Your opinion doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> it, was never, it, it was never a screw you. It yeah, was, yeah. uh, I knew full well that Steve was going to take something that I had, uh, well begun if you want, um, and, and turn it into something like cars is much larger than anything we gamed. Although that's, that's not fair. Uh, there were times like in games that 
Uh, this is not a spoiler for any of you because none of this ever happened, but okay. there are times when he'd have conversations with people like uh, Animander. Um, mm. there, there was a long thing that occurred in something that I reminded Steve of this as, as an aside quite a while back. And he, he's, like, oh my God, I forgot about that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like we took tons of notes right. when things were going on. Because mm -hmm. a lot of it was we were playing the character. We we're trying to be the person as fully as possible. Like, sure. one, I remember once one game, uh, one gaming session we'd finished and Steve said, you know, I just realized we've been playing for 10 hours and we didn't draw a sword. <laughs> oh, it was mm. all that's, conversation. That's and, the dream. Oh, never had that. Well, and that's I've tried to run games since. Uh, with friends and I try to get people interested in playing fully formed characters and you know most most of the time people are like well there's nothing to kill how is this any mm -hmm. fun mm -hmm. okay I asked Steve a while back the last time I saw him if he ever wanted to run a game again uh, he'd mentioned that he might be coming back to Winnipeg for you know a, a visit and I jokingly said oh if you're here you can run a game and he said no no I'm not going to do that mm -hmm. anymore it's it's and I think he said that in interviews uh, and in conversations since. Yeah, I think he's mentioned that with yeah, us. Yeah, it sounds like he's retired from that. Yeah. Sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, because I, I was just asking if he had ever asked you, like, what would this character do? But yeah, I think, I think that answered my question. Oh, yeah. I, I do, you, you answer questions in, a, in a, the same way that Steve does, where there's the answer to the question and then some sort of anecdote or, like, roundabout way that we get back to kind of the beginning of it. And I just, I, I love it. I love all this, this, the stories and stuff that you guys bring to your entire experiences of these characters and stuff. It's just so interesting. I think both of us really like uh, both existential philosophy and um, uh, circular reasoning. Uh, sometimes to go straight to the point misses the joy of the journey or the, the depth of the journey, if you know what I mean. Uh, if you... Mm -hmm. If you start off trying to make a, a moral point, for example, saying it's bad to kill or mm. it's bad to step on bugs, won't mean much. But if you kind of walk around the topic and point at it as you're coming from different perspectives. Right. Mm. And I think that's one thing that Steve is really, really good at is different perspectives and using that as a way of showing moral mm. uh, strength, turpitude. Um, the, the whole gamut of what it is to be a, a, a living, thinking thing and the, mir the miracle of it. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I've always really liked about Steve's stuff is that he compassion is, as he said, the, the central tenant of his books. Mm. Uh, but I think he lives that, too, if you know what I mean. It's a it's a part of his ethos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do you think uh, I mean, you say you and Steve share uh, the love of these things. Do you think it comes from being archaeologists and, and and, you know, people who study and try to live the lives of people who they'll never be able to ask these questions of? Do you think that makes it easier for you to ask these fictional characters those same questions? Um, personally, I think that 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 happened a lot for me. There was a long period of time where I know Steve was not interested in talking about philosophy at all. But one thing that I do know about Steve is that he won't do anything and he won't let you know that he does anything until he's very good at it. Mm -hmm. um, an example I'll give uh, about Steve and watching him. We were at a, a, a dinner once and it was for Steve. Um, this was after, I think, the launch of the first book um, when he came back to Winnipeg. There's 20 people sitting around a table. He's the center of attention. We're all, you know, congratulations. This is fantastic. We're, you know, mighty, mighty pleased for you. <laughs> and somebody made a joke and started telling a story. And Steve just sat back like an inch and a half and he disappeared from the conversation. He just became an observer. And it was, I just, I happened to be looking at him at the time. And I could not tell you what the story was at all. I was just fascinated by watching how he just dropped out of the world and mm -hmm. became this observing thing and not just a, a passive observer he was very active in himself uh, in observing that and i mentioned that to him much later and he kind of you know embarrassed to chuckle uh and <laughs> tried to get around it he's not a guy who t takes compliments really well if you know what i mean i i, I think he needs to prove that he's good at something before he'll talk about it I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Uh, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about my friend's characteristics. Uh, <laughs> you know. I think that's... a lot about yours, hey, Jay, India. <laughs> you're on my mind every day. <laughs> Mark, are you still are, do you, are you still active in the archaeology field? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm an archaeologist. Uh, that's my career. 
What's, what's the most recent dig you did? Uh, the most recent dig that I did would be um, we did a I did a survey uh, for a friend of mine in northern Ontario. Like um, if you were to look at a map of Canada, uh, it was up near Hudson's Bay, uh, not far from that. Um, it was a week long survey uh, using power boats. I worked with the same guy slightly before that at a place called Red Lake. And that was a that was a fantastic site. We found a bunch of material. Um, we were doing it for First Nations, um, mm. and that's that's one of the things about uh, in my mind and in a lot of people's minds, archaeology uh, sort of comes from a fairly shall I say racist uh, basis, where it's oh, we'll study you and w- mm. we'll tell you what happened in the past, mm. because there's this divorce between modern people and the things that happened in history. But for me, because you're looking through backwards facing lens, trying to get an understanding of how people lived without talking to the people immediately around you. Like uh, we, we once did a job for not Steve and I, but uh, myself and a couple of other people did a job where we were supposed to go out and just survey this one area because there are some hydro lines that were going to go in. And they said, oh, by the way, in the early 50s, this jet of uh, military jet crashed in this area and we've lost the location. Nobody knows where it is. And we've had survey crews go out there before and nobody's ever found anything. So if you guys happen to see anything, please let us know. So we got on the boat. The people that we were working for had hired a guy who uh, lived in the area uh, to take us around because he, he knew his area really well. And so we looked at him and said, do you have any idea where this is? And he went, oh, yeah, it's right there. And we all kind of... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and my, one of my partners said, well, has anybody ever asked you about this before? And he went, no. So he knew that they were looking for that, but they didn't have the brains to ask him, <laughs> right? The person mm-hmm. that lived there. So uh, archaeology has a lot to do with working f- with and for the people that whose ancestors you're, you're looking at, at least mm-hmm. American ar- North American archaeology is, mm-hmm. or is be- beginning to be more like that. So in a roundabout way to get back to the question that you asked, I would say that for me, I can say for sure that archaeology and anthropology really helped with playing more rounded characters in uh, cultures that I don't have anything to do with. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you still role play nowadays? I do still role play. Uh, it's been a while. But I, I enjoy role playing. It's just like I said, playing with other people that, that I'll say playing with people that aren't Steve. Uh, mm-hmm. It hasn't been quite as much fun because that depth isn't there. See, I think yeah. that sounds fair. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Did you have any questions for us, Mark? Well, I've listened to several of your podcasts. I haven't listened to all of them. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that part of it's weird for me to listen to other people talk about things that I did. Sure. For fun, thirty years ago. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, and I'm also, I think, I'm too close to the subject. I can't get any uh, any perspective because this is a, a close friend of mine that's written these things. And right. mm-hmm. yeah, of course. You know, I know his sense of humor. I, I, I was going to say I understand where he's coming from, but that's not the right way to put it. Steve's a very, very, in my mind, a very, very good writer, and he explores depths in ways that are often very subtle. And it's only on, I'm sure, Pete, Peter, as you might have come across it's on two or three rereads that you realize something that you realize that there's a depth to that event there's little bits that i'd love to talk about but i can't remember exactly where they are in the Mm. in the book so i don't want to no spoilers Mm -hmm. (laughs) but there's a couple of things that uh, there's one small small ish story there's one sentence in those books that just broke my heart Mm -hmm. that was one of the most punch in the face moving things that i think uh, anywhere that i've ever read uh and I mentioned that to Steve and he was, I think his reaction was, what? Uh, oh, oh, okay. That's weird. Mark, are you feeling okay? <laughs> um, there's a couple of things that he's written in those books that I've had to put the book down and just walk away. There's a sentence that one of the, and this is, if this is a spoiler, it's four words. So it's not something I would think of as a spoiler. Uh, one of the, <clears throat> this spoiler-ish, one of the Talana Mass, you're in his head and the term that he uses is no inside, no outside when talking about being human. And that, to me, is a profound statement. Mm-hmm. That's to, to dissolve the barriers between what it is to be human. Like Martin Buber's I and Thou is about the separation of, uh, of my ego from the world and from other people. And to say no inside, no outside is that's a pretty massive statement. And the fact that he just slipped it into one character thinking something once 
is something that I, I, I remember wanting to call him up and just like talk to him for hours about that. But mm. I also know that Steve would probably be like, eh, I don't want to talk about that. That's <laughs> great. I'm glad you like that. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> That's cool. So I guess the things that I would ask are, um, I remember that I, I think India, you've only read one other set of fantasy novels before. It, it really wasn't even, it, that was more of like kind of a joke. I read Twilight and I called it a fantasy novel and it's not. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never, I've <laughs> never read fantasy before. Um, this was, and, and, you know, diving in as this is my first book series has been super steep of a learning curve. And even now I think I oftentimes I'm like, I don't, get it i just don't josh will pick up on things and aj picks up on things and they message about them and i'm just like how did how did you figure that out and it goes back to what you said you know like even you knowing steve and and being able to pick up on those little things that he writes and and you don't realize that it's going to have so much meaning and then it does and it's 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 so interesting it's it it really is Hmm. exciting and it, it, it just it I don't know I don't I don't have words for it because even and then we talk to Steve and he says things and I'm just like wow I never even thought of it in that way so um, I'm excited and that this is my first experience but it's been it's been a, a couple of books a rough <laughs> couple of books <laughs> buckle in kid you're in for a hell yeah. of a ride <laughs> I mean starting starting off in any kind of genre with something as complex and deep as Steve's books, uh, congratulations on keeping with it. I mean, that's, <laughs> they're not easy reads, but Steve is one of those writers that expects something out of the reader. Yeah. You know, this isn't television. Mm-hmm. Well, this isn't a half hour soap opera. This isn't, uh, you know, s- some bad situation comedy. You know, he's talking about what it is, what, what does it mean to be? What does it mean to be a human? What are the causes, effects, and results of being a cognitive thing in the universe? Uh, especially a cognitive thing with power, right? Like uh, almost all of those characters that are effective characters in the world influence the 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 whole thing, right? There, there's minor characters or people without much power. Like one guy with a cusser can change the world, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, one one woman with a with a a knife and a good knowledge of uh, magic can change the world and can say things to massively important characters that can give them pause for thought, mm-hmm. and that's. None of his characters are invulnerable except for, well, Caller, but that guy's a prick. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you mention um, as an entry into the genre, and I'd be curious to hear, you've talked a lot about your feelings. Obviously, this role-playing with Steve has meant a lot to you, and obviously the, these books in this world mean a lot to you. And I think something that we don't talk about um, that much on the show because we're very much talking about the the, the chapters usually um, is uh, how much some of the complexities, especially morally and when it comes to discussing violence, stand in contrast to how it is portrayed in mm, other types of fantasy, other types of role playing and maybe the genre as a whole, you know? And um, I wonder how, because, I don't know, I I, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but a lot of times violence is very, I don't know, sanitized, it's very careless, it's, I don't know. Playing role-playing games often involves a lot of killing and very little thinking about it, and Mm -hmm. a lot of fantasy books contain that as well. So I wonder how you've talked about feeling like, a disconnect from other types of role playing or other type of fantasy, as some Malzahn fans say. And I wonder how you relate to that nowadays and whether you feel that disconnect to the genre or is it more specifically about other mm, game masters? Well, that's a good question. Um, with other game masters, uh, it kind of depends on what they, what the underpinnings of their world are. If you live in a place where callousness is expected, to be a bleeding heart just means you're going to get killed quickly. I mean, Steve writes uh, violence in a, look, this is somebody being killed. This isn't, you know, like TV shows where uh, I always remember, uh, I'm dating myself here, but the A-team, you know, five guys jump out of a van and fire fully automatic weapons for yeah. 25 minutes <laughs> on, you know, it's just ridiculous. And nobody, and if somebody gets hurt, there's a little like red spot on their shoulder and it's always the shoulder and it's always, you know, they're tough enough to take it. Like, mm. you know, get your nose broken once and tell me you're going to be able to survive being shot. Uh, Steve kind of, he wrote in a way that, writes in a way that, 
that violence has real effect, right? You know, I've never been on a battlefield, but I know people who have been, and uh, the screaming and crying and begging for life is a reality. And if you're trying to write about realistic people, then that's going to happen. And that's one of the things that I kind of have this hatred of uh, half hour television shows because they teach you that if a moral dilemma can't be solved in half an hour, don't think about it anymore. Whereas with uh, books like the way Steve writes, when it comes to his writing, he's not pulling any punches. It's like, look, this is reality. Just because it's in a fantasy world doesn't mean it's not real. That, that the effects of one human's action onto another aren't going to be real. When it comes to other fantasy writers or uh, other people in the fa- that write in that world, a lot of it is meant to be entertainment, you know, and it's uh, fast fun and, you know, dusky death and dangerous doings and all that kind of thing. <laughs> and they're often, they're interesting reads and they're fun reads and they're enjoyable reads. And I wouldn't diss them for that. There are some really, really good writers who write that way. I don't know if they shy away from the, what does it feel like to actually be stabbed? But there's not many people that are willing to, I guess I want to say, force their readers to confront that. You know, but going back to Carsa and uh, the the rapes, I mean, I know that a lot of people have had seriously strong reactions to that. And I did, too, when I read that. I, I was kind of, you know, but this is my guy. What are you doing? Um, but that would have been not an unreal thing for him to do. I mean, you know, for most of human history, people tortured as a matter of course. And, you know, how does that work? Uh, how does uh, how does that affect the torturer? Well, most of the people that Steve has written that are torturers are broken people. You know, how much damage can you cause in the world before it starts damaging you? Well, that's one of the questions that I think, consciously or not, Steve ended up working on or working through or trying to come to an understanding of. It's, I mean, there's not a lot of writers in any genre that will plumb the depths. I mean, one of my other favorites, like William Gibson is an amazingly good writer. Beautiful, brilliant moving books but his you know his death scenes aren't necessarily harrowing they can be but they're not always um uh, yeah. what's his name the guy that wrote the sorry i have to look at my bookshelf to remember people's <laughs> names i mean patrick rothfuss uh, wrote fantastic novels they're they're yeah. amazingly good I, I can't wait for the third one to come out i um, do love that you said sorry. wrote instead of rights pretty <laughs> choice <laughs> well you know <laughs> How, how long's it been? We're going on like a decade, baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Why can't I think of his name? Anyway, anyway, there's other writers that are very, very, very good writers, but they don't necessarily, they aren't willing. To, I don't know if this is true, but they aren't willing to, it seems to me, look at that with unflinching eyes. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, that's one of the things I really like about Steve's writing. Steve is an author, continually impressive in that he'll confront those things. Yeah, I think the four of us, certainly shared some criticisms of that storyline when we talked about the Carsa part in House of Chains. But I do think that we are in agreement. And I think despite those criticisms and any whatever we talk about on the show, I think, I don't know, I think we all agree that Steve's place in the, I don't know, canon, pantheon, whatever the word is, I feel, obviously, I feel very fine and good about it. I think he's he earns it and it's well done. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, he's not afraid of controversy, which is a good thing. Yeah. He's nah, part of he. No, he isn't. Steve is not afraid to. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, stir the pot. And you got to admire that bravery. I mean, yeah. even if you don't mm-hmm. like it, being willing to confront, you know, what's it what's it like to do something as heinous and, and, and horrible and unforgivable as that? Uh, will a character turn away from the, that guilt for the rest of their life? And if they do, how does that haunt them or does that haunt them? Right. I think almost all of his characters are haunted by their past. Most of us feel guilt about things we did when we were six. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is probably moving towards the end of it here. So I wanted to uh, thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. I wonder if my hosts, co-hosts, have any, uh, anything else to add or to say? No, I, I, I just uh, thank you so much for coming on and, and for being... Uh... So nice to so honestly lovely conversation like it was yeah. a super chill love in the vibe we yeah. had a great time yeah. I am very cognizant of my role playing shortcomings yeah so I guess I'm gonna be really <laughs> really sitting here thinking about that for a while no, you sound like it it sounds like it'd be fun to game together to be honest but you yeah. know oh, it'd be great um, I'd love to 
Um, I've really enjoyed this. I was really nervous about uh, doing this. Um, I've never really, other than with friends, mm. talked to them about this kind of thing and, you know, kind of talking in public. I, I really hope that Steve doesn't listen to this in, whenever this comes out and go, okay, Mark, that's it. I'm <laughs> going to kill you now. It's going to send you a gag order or something. We, uh, we, we, uh, we've actually bl we've blacklisted Steve's yeah. whole IP. He can't, he can't get this one. <laughs> This one's just for us, baby. Yeah, it's in the vault. Sweet. <laughs> that guy's a prick. I, that. <laughs> I want that to be the opening, the opening thing oh of this episode. <laughs> Sour music. That guy's a prick, prick. baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, please don't right. do that. <laughs> no, no, I won't. Don't worry. Don't worry. I won't do you like that. Well, once again, thank you so much, Mark Paxton McRae, for coming on the show. Uh, let us know what you think of our interview at 10 Very Big Books on Gmail and Twitter. And, uh, mm, goodbye. See? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Very natural, very smooth. Good, goodbye. <laughs>